video games. This is probably one of the few mediums that's based on conflict and battling. Um, unless you're a walking sim, or a puzzle game, or a visual novel, or any genre that foregoes violence. Though if you're lacking in diplomacy, the best way to end a conflict is with a good old weapon. Swords, guns, both. Whether it be outlandish or realistic, popular or obscure, as long as it can kill something, it'll find a way onto this list. Obviously, I'll be focusing on weapons that originated from video games, and I'll be limiting it just to one type of weapon per entry to avoid the list from being flooded with swords or generic assault rifle number 40 billion. That and I noticed the definition of a weapon has been stretched to accommodate almost everything, from pocket monsters to turtle shells, so I'll be defining a weapon as a device that you hold in your hand and can directly be used to kill enemies. So indirect damage from something like the portal gun doesn't count. And because I don't feel like going through too many hurdles, no end game or post game weapons. It seems like a good enough set of rules. With all that said, let's get started. I love going to a mall, but my god, there are so many annoyances when going between shops, crowded escalators, the risk of bumping into people, mindless consumers filling the halls. Oh, and the, the zombies are a minor annoyance as well. Thankfully, the Dead Rising games have got the proper tool to fight off the undead horde. And no, I'm not talking about the protagonist. <laughs> From Dead Rising 2 and onwards, the combo weapons were the go-to apparatus to decimate all those psychos and unalive fellows slowing you down during your commutes. I could go for the absurd combos in the later games like the Assault Rifle Shotgun Combo, a Flamethrower Scythe, or a Steamroller Motorcycle thing, but I'll keep it nice and simple with the Defiler. Do you want a blunt weapon to smash the undead's head in, or a sharp weapon to cut them down? Uh, here's a better question. How's about both? This axe sledgehammer combo will rip the enemies a new one while running around like a madman looking for survivors. It's a great weapon to bring into boss fights, seeing as it deals a good amount of damage, and it's noticeably more durable than the average combo weapon, which breaks if you look at it too hard. The best part is that both components used to make this are pretty easy to find, making it the perfect go-to weapon for each mission. There's a few experiences that can match killing from the shadows. Stealth kills are a rush, taking the enemies out while everyone's too dumbfounded on where this dead body came from, and watching the enemies be too dense to know where you are will rarely lose its charm. And while some people might like to get up close and personal with a knife to the jugular, I prefer a nice clean shot to the dome. That said, shooting at specs in the distance isn't all that cathartic, so what about a mid-range rifle that's dead silent? Metro 2033 is a mix between stealth and action, and when those lights go out, you need the proper tool to kill from the shadows. And, uh, I don't know. An assault rifle isn't exactly what I'd call the most quiet weapon out there. So to avoid making too much noise, let's use a rifle without any gunpowder. The Thinar, aside from having the most difficult name to spell thus far, is a pretty fun weapon to mess around with. But getting ammo for this thing is a pain, so let's focus on the direct upgrade to this air rifle, the Helsing. Often when stealth is involved, a bow and arrow is a good weapon to turn to. The Helsing is just that, but with the added benefit of being able to rapid fire. The beauty of this gun is that it's all compressed air, meaning that your stealth fantasy can be lived out beautifully. Oh, and the arrows can be retrieved from the dead targets, which is awesome. Though one annoyance is that you'll have to pump up the gun just to get it to fire at full strength, but for damage outputs that are this lethal, I'd say it's a harmless compromise. Well, this'll be awkward. There comes a moment where rules have to be stretched a little. As in, it's a bit of a stretch to put Junkrat's entire kit on this list, since it's four tools as opposed to just one. Blowing shit up is fun though, so I'll make an exception. Overwatch is a game where every weapon and ability is conceptually interesting, but very few offer a level of versatility like these murder tools. I have my preferred class to play on either offense or defense, but often while playing either, I'll pick Junkrat for his beautiful tool set. The main weapon is a bomb launcher that shoots explosive rounds that'll explode when hitting an enemy, and bounces around when hitting the wall or floors. A bear trap acting as the ultimate troll move when putting in the middle of doorways, and being a nasty combo when used with the third tool, a landmine. For reasons that go beyond defying logic, these landmines hurt the enemies, but leave you unaffected, and lets you bomb jump to your heart's content. Also, some madman at Blizzard decided to add an extra landmine to Junkrat's arsenal. Because, the f*** it, why not? 
As for his ultimate, it's a remote controlled bomb that synergizes well with the rest of the kit. Since it takes advantage of bomb jumping to a random locations, acting as the perfect coup de gras when you just want to end things off with a bang. Finding a unique weapon in Kid Icarus Uprising is like finding a specific grain of sand in the desert. Every weapon from their design to their statistical differences to the damage output makes each of them worth using at least once. I was gonna go the easy route and pick one of the claws due to their balance with melee and range attack, but I found a different alternative. Design-wise, the compact arm stands out from the lot for being rather subdued compared to all the other weapons. Even the weapons in the same class are more over the top in their design alone. So, uh, what is the selling point here? Well, let's look at the firing rate and HOLY SHOTS ALMIGHTY! Look at this firing rate! This is still in the melee category, mind you, and yet it has the firing speed of more range-based weapons like, say, the Palm or the Orbitars. Then there's Pit's actual speed when the arm is equipped. You can run to your heart's content and rarely need to care about your stamina since it's almost as light as the claws. The noticeable trade-off is that contrary to the fact that it's an arm, it's not the most powerful as a melee weapon. Actually, it's one of the weakest in its own class, but if you're not abusing the insane firing speed, then you're not using it, right? Weapons that manipulate the environment are quite fascinating. Other weapons can manipulate the enemies by turning a living enemy into a dead one, but what about the world? And while there are a few that fit into this category, the majority of them are kind of boring, so I guess I'll be like every other dork online and give praise to the gravity. I'll go into some obscure territory and bring up the Axiom Disruptor. On the surface, this looks like any old laser gun. It goes pew 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 and the enemies die. However, the further you explore in the depths of Sudra, and the amount of things this blaster can do will become staggering. There's additions such as a drill, a small drone, and a grappling hook, but the main draw for me are the different beam types and the field disruptor. In the average Metroid game, you get about four different beam types. Here, you get over 20, each of which being unique from one another with how much of the screen they take up and how hard it actually hits, allowing you to devastate the opposition. Then there's the gun's noteworthy feature, which is to glitch out the enemies and even parts of the world, making it easier to navigate. You even get a power bomb to bug out an entire room in case glitching the game isn't bizarre enough. Really, the only problem is that the glitching power was limited to making a few obstacles go away and materialize the platforms. That's such a shame, because it is by far one of the most unique ideas for a weapon floating around the indie scene in recent memory. Throughout the list, we've seen some fun and unique weapons, but from here, things get a little over the top. <laughs> Understatement of the century! The Wonderful 101 is a special kind of game. This is the type of game where you can swing around weapons the size of a school bus to beat down giant robots that go from friggin' large to a skyscraper on legs. So, in a game where hands can absorb fire and bombs can slow down time, the weapon that I'd say stood out was Unite Claws. This Unite Morph is a blast to use, mostly due to its elemental abilities and combo potential. Several of the morphs in the Wonderful 101 have an elemental property to it. For hands, it's fire, for sword, it's electricity, and for claws, it's ice. And unlike other weapons, its ice powers are active at all times, freezing enemies solid and making them vulnerable to hard-hitting attacks. This makes the claws the perfect combo tool for taking down enemies and getting a high rank due to the amount of hits these claws can get in. Flashy, over the top, and infinitely useful? I can't think of a better reason than to end it off by saying that this weapon is just... wonderful. Also, it can climb walls. 10 out of 10. Fallout. The post-apocalyptic open world where you can do many things, though it mostly leads to you killing people and taking what isn't nailed to the ground. And in a game where you can kill to your heart's content, obviously there's a nice selection of murder tools to pick from like the iconic Fat Man. But not just any Fat Man, the experimental MIRV, which is well regarded for firing five mini-nukes and having the largest blast radius in the game. Though, uh, it might be a little bit too powerful for my taste. I don't know, it'd be nice to shoot my weapon close by and not get blown up in the process. So, here's my less powerful but more fun alternative. Throughout my many treks throughout the wasteland, I found something quite odd. While keeping my supplies of weapons, health, and ammo, I kept finding railway spikes, and for some reason they were in the ammo category. 
How strange. Many quests later, and I found myself in possession of a blueprint for a gun that uses this bizarre ammo called the Railway Rifle. One pile of junk later, and we got ourselves a goofy little rifle that shoots nails that are used to hold train tracks together. The damage on one nail alone is pretty high, and the range is nothing to laugh at. It's pretty effective at crippling limbs, making the use of vats more useful than with the majority of the other guns. And when you deal a critical hit to the dome, the enemy's head will actually fly off and get nailed to the wall behind them, which is extremely satisfying. Also, it makes a little toot sound after firing a spike, which always put a dumb smile on my face. While this is far from the most memorable item that you can get in Fallout 3, it was a pretty good go-to weapon to build, and I'm glad to see that it made a return in Fallout 4. Ratchet and Clank since day one, the series sold itself on fun platforming and over-the-top weapons. Of the games that I actually played so far, that being Quest for treasure and a crack in time, the one weapon that resonated with me was the Spiral of Death. Overkill name aside, this bladed weapon shoots out a large cyan-colored energy blade at the enemy, and after firing, this blade acts like a boomerang. Because of this, the spiral can potentially hit enemies twice, once on the way out and again on the return. It has a low rate of fire, and the ammo count is not that large, but it's made up for it with a heavy amount of damage that just one blade can do. Then you level this weapon up to level 5, and it becomes the Spiral of Carnage. A rather fitting name. Now it can fire up to three kinetic blades at once, turning anything in front of you into shredded flesh and bolts, making it the perfect weapon to take on larger enemies. Also, on a somewhat related side note, the Star Off is a fan made weapon that have won a contest that Insomniac held. And I guess even the best come from humble origins. Another game from Platinum. Well, someone's doing something right. Bayonetta is the type of game where it's possible to quad-wield guns, shoot hornets from a bow, and skate around on chainsaws. The last one is just... beautiful. So this series is no stranger to impractical and dumb weapons, like... No, but the Chain Chop was a close second to a certain bladed weapon. No, not the Sherba or the Roxasia, but the three-pronged reaping tool from hell, the Chernabog. Scythes are just that kind of weapon that exists in the stupidly awesome camp. Initially, these were used for cutting crops and looking scary when depicting death. Given the right flair, these gardening tools go from impractical to f***ing fun to watch in action scenes, and even more fun to be used in games. The Chernabog is a masterclass in style, with its three-pronged blade and slick silver and purple color scheme. Then there's the reach on this thing. With the right combo, you can hit all the enemies in a room, and if somehow they're out of your reach, you can hold the attack button down and shoot the blades out like a f***ing shotgun. Despite this being the best combination of pure yes, it's... Uh, not perfect. The wind-up for every swing is annoying when compared to the twin blades that you get earlier in the game, though it is one of the harder-hitting weapons, so that's to be expected. But if you were to combo this with the fast weapon, like, say, the dual whips, you have a nasty pair of weapons that'll put the forces of Paradiso through hell. And Inferno? Well, they aren't far behind. In terms of well-known weapons and media, most turn to swords. For some reason. I'm still not 100% sure why the concept of swinging around a sharpened piece of metal on a hilt has such a cathartic feel to it, but the appeal persists to this very day. Many of these weapons have become iconic, like the Master Sword, which is iconic in the sense that a vanilla ice cream cone is iconic. Oh my gosh, it has all this lore behind it! it doesn't stop it from being a pretty boring weapon whose world-saving power can be matched by a bottle. I don't know, I play video games to have fun, and a mechanically more interesting weapon that's more my cup of tea is the Monado from Xenoblade. There's a philosophy with Japanese media that I really like, where the weapon is seen more as an extension of the user itself rather than just a weapon. Look hard enough in most Japanese media and you'll see what I mean. The Monado is a great example of this trope done well in video games, as it's used to show how far the protagonist grows throughout their journey by taking on a different appearance throughout the story and growing stronger as a result. Aesthetically, the sword is a thing of beauty. Its slick red body with the blue neon lights opening up to have the laser blade extend outward gives it a memorable look. Outside of appearances, it's incredibly helpful in combat with several powerful abilities at its disposal. The main ability is to slash at opponents, even having a stronger variant of the sword attack that can cut down Mechon easily. However, the Monado shines in supporting allies as well by making them able to pierce Mechon armor, defend or dodge fatal attacks, or debuff the enemy. This moveset was so useful that it had to even be included with Shulk and Smash Brothers. 
Then there's the ability to predict the future. This makes it an interesting element in the story and in gameplay, seeing as Shell can use this to not only predict the future, but if he and the player are strong enough, they can change it as well. It's not just a something fancy that you swing around in cutscenes, it adds to the experience as a whole. And for a weapon that effectively became the unofficial icon of Xenoblade, I can't think of a better place than the number one spot. This has been the Renegade Master, signing out.